We've talked extensively about our favorite clone commanders on this channel, and while most of them served in the Republic with honor, it's no secret that we absolutely despise the Coruscant Guard. But it's not fair to say that they were all bad because of Commander Fox. Some of them were just trying to be good soldiers. So who exactly were the Coruscant Guard's commanders? In this video, we'll be comparing the hated, the beloved, and the forgotten commanders of the Coruscant Guard. Attention, Sergeant on deck! We've talked about why we dislike the Coruscant Guard in many past videos, largely because, in many ways, the Coruscant Guard represented Palpatine testing the waters for his future stormtroopers. The Coruscant Guard was portrayed as the last line of defense in the capital, when in reality, it served to suppress dissent and help form the Republic into the Galactic Empire. When more citizens became unsatisfied with how the war was going, the Coruscant Guard equipped themselves with riot shields and electric batons to put down demonstrations of free speech. This was a bad idea, since, in the words of Commander Adama of the Battlestar Galactica, There's a reason why you separate military and the police. One fights the enemy of the state, the other serves and protects the people. When the military becomes both, then the enemies of the state tend to become the people. The Coruscant Guard validated Adama's rule. The blending of these two roles led them to see anyone in violation of Republic law as an enemy combatant. While often stationed on Coruscant, the Coruscant Guard could also be seen securing ports or escorting high-level diplomats and Jedi on off-world missions. Let's start with the infamous and largely hated Commander Fox. CC-1010 was one of the most highly decorated soldiers in the Republic, known for his combat skills and eagerness to charge into battle. On a real battlefield, he might have made a pretty fearless frontline force commander, as he was unafraid to go up against even a Jedi. He was Palpatine's right hand, and under his command, the Coruscant Guard became the fist of the Republic police state, willing to repress and persecute separatist sympathizers and innocent non-humans alike. But before he became the enemy of the people, he genuinely believed he was fighting to protect Coruscant from separatists. Working closely with Senator Amidala to arrest Zero the Hutt after Zero was involved in the kidnapping of Rota the Hutt. While he was successful in this operation, Fox was unable to stop bounty hunter Cad Bane from freeing Zero later on, even allowing several senators to be held hostage. He also waved several cleaner droids through to a secure Republic facility, calling them stupid droids. Well, it turns out these stupid droids were actually separatist suicide bombers staging a major attack on Coruscant, ultimately taking out the city's power and spreading terror among citizens. Fox was never held accountable for this failure though, even though it was his fault the droids got past the security checkpoint. Fox was by the book and had a rather strict approach to command. This was why Commander Rex and Commander Fox disagreed so much. While Rex had the opportunity to meet and learn from the people the Republic was fighting for, Fox was in charge of stifling dissent and maintaining order on Coruscant. While we may not like Commander Fox, we have to give him credit, as very few people, clones especially, would have the balls to stand up to Anakin Skywalker. In fact, Anakin, later Darth Vader, would continue holding a grudge against Fox for arresting Ahsoka and killing Ark Trooper Fives. When Order 66 was issued, Fox led the Coruscant Guard to hunt down and execute any Jedi on Coruscant, calling his involvement as such. I was here on Coruscant. I did my part. All the clones did. Shut those Jedi agitators down cold. After the fall of the Republic, he served the Empire as part of the Imperial Shock Troopers, leading a unit in an attack on the Jedi Temple with Vader as they hunted some of the surviving Jedi. He eventually got what he deserved when Vader force choked him because he had forgotten to tell his troops not to shoot the Sith Lord, whom they had mistaken as a Jedi. Moving on to perhaps the most loved Coruscant Guard commander, we have Commander Thorne and his famous last stand. Surprisingly little is known about Thorne's life. We don't even know his official clone number. Commander Thorne wore phase 2 clone armor and had the distinctive red markings of the Coruscant Guard with two wings painted on his helmet. He was a good leader and a cunning strategist, thanks to his training and experience. He must have valued honesty and honor and was able to see a situation for what it was and wasn't afraid to tell his higher-ups about the reality on the ground. He was equipped, like most officers, with DC-17 hand blasters, but he preferred to carry the less common Z-6 rotary blaster cannon. 
a portable minigun that could spray an impressive 166 bolts per minute. While not accurate at longer ranges, the Z6 still packed as much of a punch as a DC-15A and was the weapon of choice for clones who liked to spray and pray, such as Heavy, Hardcase, and of course, Thorn. He affectionately referred to his Z6 as the Hammer, a homage to the fact the design was loosely based on the Norse god and later comic book character Thor. In 19 BBY, he took a garrison of shock troopers to escort Senator Padme Amidala to the planet Scipio. They arrived on several LAAT gunships and a consular class cruiser. The Republic had sent the envoy to oversee the transfer of the intergalactic banking clan to Rush Clovis, who had pledged support for the Republic cause, only to be exposed as Dooku's pawn. The Separatists launched a surprise invasion of Scipio that was picked up on the Republic cruiser's scanners. Realizing his troops were exposed on the landing platform, Commander Thorne reacted quickly, making all the right moves. He quickly contacted Senator Amidala and requested her to get to safety. He then ordered his pilots to take off immediately and moved all the troops inside the city gates. Unfortunately, he was faced with a droid ambush, with hyena-class droid bombers taking out all Republic gunships and their frigate almost instantly. The clone troopers responded with shoulder fire rockets, taking one bomber out. However, they were soon surrounded by squads of B2 super battle droids and BX Commando droids dropped by several HMP droid gunships. Outnumbered and outgunned, Commander Thorne and his garrison fought to the last man, each clone taking down multiple droids. Thorne was the last man standing, wielding the hammer as he took down numerous B2s and BX Commando droids, even smashing them with his Z6 when they got too close. Like the absolute legend he was, he took four blaster shots straight to the chest before falling valiantly in service to the Republic he so much believed in. Thorne would have gotten along well with Fox as fellow soldiers, but they probably would have disagreed when it came to matters of leadership. Fox preferred head-on charges, while Thorne cared about his men more and wouldn't hesitate to order tactical retreats. Both were staunchly loyal and ready to die for the Republic, but Thorne had a more balanced view compared to Fox, who might not have called Senator Amidala and told her to get to safety because he would have been too busy rushing the enemy. Conversely, if Thorne was in charge of the prison, he may have been a little more sympathetic to Ahsoka. Last, and often forgotten by most fans, is Commander Thyre, who as a lieutenant accompanied Master Yoda on a mission to the moon Ragosa and later served as part of Emperor Palpatine's personal clone guard. Known as CC4477 or Thyre, he was assigned to accompany Jedi Grandmaster Yoda on a diplomatic mission on Rugosa to meet with King Katunko of Neutral Toydaria. Any pretense that this was meant to be a peaceful mission was quickly destroyed alongside their Republic frigate when the frigate was ambushed by two munificent class star frigates. Using an escape pod, Yoda and Thaya reached the moon's surface some distance away from the meeting point. Asajj Ventress proposed a challenge to Master Yoda over a hollow transmission when Yoda called King Katunko, sending an entire droid battalion to wipe them out. During their retreat, Thaya was injured by a rocket and his squad was pinned down until Master Yoda saved them. To help a wounded Thaya walk, Yoda cut a DC-15 blaster rifle and fashioned a crutch for him. Yoda had this to say to Thaya. Thyre, rush not into fights. Long is the war. Only by surviving it will you prevail. Yes. It seems that Thyre would take this advice seriously and he would live to see the end of the war and eventually went on to serve the Empire. Following the success of their mission on Rugosa, Thyre completed the ARC training program and was promoted to commander placed in charge of the Coruscant Guard. Together with Republic Intelligence Director Armand Issard, Commander Thyre helped found the Homeworld Security Command, an initiative to centralize and streamline the defensive response should Coruscant ever come under attack, a notion very few in the Corps took seriously. But Thyre was always paranoid and fearful that the Republic couldn't defend the capital from a siege. His worst fears were realized when General Grievous launched a surprise attack on Coruscant. Thyre, along with Commander Apo's 501st Legion, fought ferociously to defend the Senate District, but the attack soon became Thyre's worst nightmare come to life, as he was powerless to stop Grievous and his Magna Guards from abducting Chancellor Palpatine. After the execution of Order 66, Commander Thyre was ironically tasked with hunting down Master Yoda, the very Jedi who saved his life long ago. 
His efforts were in vain, however, as Yoda had already escaped Coruscant with the help of Bail Organa. Commander Thayer then took a squad to Mustafar with Emperor Palpatine to pick up a barbecued Anakin Skywalker and transport him to a medical facility to complete his transformation into Darth Vader. What happened to Thayer afterward is unknown, but it's likely he continued to serve the Empire as the head of the Imperial Shock Troopers on Coruscant. Thayer was more reserved than the other two commanders and perhaps even a little more timid. While Fox and Thorn were quick to respond to threats, Thayer preferred to think and devise a plan. He may have found the other two commander's energy a bit too much for him, having wisened up due to his injury early in the war. So that's the story of the three Coruscant Guard commanders, but what do you think? Do you agree with our assessment of Fox, Thorn, and Thyre? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section below, and as always guys, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next one. <laughs>